Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is look at Gauss's law and I want to apply Gauss's law to calculate the electric field produced uh, by a non-uniform charge distribution. All right, so this is the charge distribution I'm considering. It has a function uh, that, that depends on the distance from the center of the sphere. So the question is, how do you calculate the electric field everywhere in space when you're within the sphere and when you're outside the sphere? Okay, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, first I just want to consider this charge distribution right here. Let's, for example, look at what happens to the charge distribution when I'm at the center of this sphere. Well, all you do is you just substitute little r is equal to zero here, and what you get is uh, rho zero is simply a constant. You substitute little r equals to zero, and you're left with this that you have a charge density at the center of the sphere equal to rho zero. Now what happens as I move toward the outside, so that little radius r starts tending toward the uppercase r, the actual radius of that sphere. Uh, so you go ahead and you substitute that uh, into our equation over here. What you get here is uh, everything in this bracket is going to cancel out and you're going to get zero. So what you have here is a linear dependence also. So you have more charge at the center of the sphere, less charge as I move uh, toward the outside. Another thing I want to mention about this problem here is that the total charge inside the sphere is given by Q total. So later on, we're going to see there's going to be a relationship between this constant rho zero and the total charge. Okay, the first thing we do then is uh, we're considering case one where r is less than uh, the radius of the sphere. So what you do is you place a Gaussian surface, with in this case a spherically symmetric Gaussian surface, and it has a radius r, and my next goal then is just to write down uh, Gauss's law for this case. Uh, so I have the integral of e dot dA is equal to one divided by epsilon zero multiplied by how much charge is actually enclosed in that surface. Uh, the next thing you do then is replace that enclosed charge by a volume integral. Right? I'm going to integrate this charge density, which depends on the radius, and I have to integrate over the volume. So this is standard approach, right? Um, what I can do next is just substitute the actual expression for that uh, charge density that I have for this specific problem. Um, and now what we're going to do is just start evaluating uh, the left-hand side of Gauss's law and the right-hand side. So the first thing you can write for the left-hand side here is, since we have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, the field will point outward here on this dashed line everywhere, and it's going to have a constant magnitude. So you can take it out of the integral. And then what you're left with is what is the integral of this spherical Gaussian surface? Well, that's simply four pi r squared. Uh, the next term I factored out the row zero, bring that to the front, and now I'm just simply performing a volume integral in spherical coordinates. So there's an integral over the angle phi, over the angle theta, and also an integral over the radius, right? These are standard expressions. All right, the next thing we're going to notice is that, well, the integral over both of these angles, this here can simply be evaluated since the charge density doesn't depend on any of those angles. And this is simply a, a common expression that reduces to, and is equal to four pi. All right, our next step then is going to simply cancel out those four pi's, um, bringing, sorry, that really simplifies our expression. And now we're in a position now where we can evaluate this integral here on the right-hand side involving the radius. These are simply going to be polynomial terms, so they're easy to evaluate. Once you distribute this r squared over, you're going to have an r squared term here, and you're going to have an r cubed term. So that's easy to evaluate. And then you simply evaluate it between the limits of zero all the way to um, this Gaussian surface radius, little r. All right, so that's what I'm doing now, um, just evaluating that integral. And now you notice you have r squared over here, and here I have an r cubed and an r4. Well. Um, I can factor out at least an r squared term right there, divide through by r squared, and that simplifies my expression a little bit further. 
Okay, so you're going to have a linear term that's left and then also a quadratic term in little r. All right, we uh, can factor out one of those r values, and this is the expression that I'm left. Now, it looks rather complicated, uh, but that's okay. Uh, now, this density rho zero, uh, we can also write that in terms of the total charge contained inside this spherically symmetric object. So let's go on the next page. I'm going to show you how you can accomplish that. All right, the goal now is just to write that uh, density rho zero in terms of the total charge contained inside this uh, sphere. So what we're going to do then is simply just write that the total charge has to be the integral when I evaluate it over this entire volume, okay? So this is uh, just the standard integral. Again, we're doing a three-dimensional integral. We are doing this in spherical coordinates, so we apply the same approach, except now look at the limits of integration. They go from zero all the way to the radius of this sphere. Okay, well, this is, uh, again, a straightforward integral to evaluate. Um, you multiply this through, we get a quadratic term and a cubic term. And now when you integrate that, um, again, the quadratic term becomes r cubed divided by 3. The cubic term becomes r4 divided by 4. And now we're ready to substitute in the limits. Okay, uh, once you substitute the limits over here, now both of those terms now end up being uh, r cubed terms. And once you put things on a common denominator, okay, you got to do a little bit of work here, you're able to reduce it to this expression. So guess what that means? That means our last step then is you can write rho zero as being three times the total charge divided by pi r to the third power. Okay, so we're going to use this result now. Let's go back to our electric field expression, and we're going to write it just in terms of the total charge contained inside the sphere. All right, so I have my electric field expression. Again, there's nothing wrong with this expression here. It's perfectly valid. I have the connection now between this constant rho zero and the total charge. I'm also going to use this uh, constant k here if I wanted to just eliminate epsilon zero. There's many ways to write this. They're all the same. It doesn't matter what you choose. Um, anyway, I'm just going to make this substitution now. So rho zero gets substituted by uh, this expression. Uh, now you can see there's a pi times epsilon zero here in the numerator. So I can replace that now with the constant 4k. Um, so that's my next step over here. And maybe one last step, maybe just to clean it up a little bit. Um, again, just writing it again slightly differently here. Maybe bring this four across both terms. So we'll get rid of this other one here in the denominator. And anyway, this is just another expression for the electric field in terms of maybe different values. Okay, the constant K and Q total. Okay, depending on how the problem is worded, uh, you may have to do a little bit more math to get it in this form. Okay, now I want to consider the case too now when we're outside of this spherical object. So let's apply Gauss's law to that case. All right, this is case two. Now the radius is bigger than the radius of the sphere. So guess what? Look where my Gaussian surface is, right? It's located on the outside of all of the charges in this case, right? Um, so we write down Gauss's law. And again, since we're dealing with a spherically symmetric object, the left-hand side of Gauss's law will simplify to this expression. Electric field multiplied by 4 pi r squared. Now the key is this term right here, the charge enclosed. The charge enclosed now, if you look at it, it's every single bit of charge that we have inside the object is located inside this Gaussian surface. So guess what? You just replace that with the total charge of the object, all right, divided by epsilon zero. Now we simply isolate for the electric field, right? We're gonna bring this term here in the denominator and we're left with just a standard looking expression. Again, if you wanna introduce the constant K here, which is one over four pi epsilon zero, you can write the electric field now just using this nice compact form. And this is valid anywhere R is bigger than the radius of that sphere. That's it, that's all. This is a really easy case to do. All right, so to summarize, this is what we have. So we have the two regions, uh, little r less than the radius and little r bigger than the radius. 
Um, these were my two field expressions, and now it's a good idea to plot them. Okay, so when little r is equal to zero, you notice that the electric field here on the left-hand side goes to zero. So I started right over here. Now, again, this expression is valid all the way up into the radius of the sphere. All right, and really, if you would multiply this out, you should see that this does look like a parabola, okay? So in this region over here, it means it goes through a maximum, okay? The electric field goes through a maximum point. And in this case, I calculated it, and I'll show you on the next page how I did that, but you simply take the derivative and set it equal to zero to find where the maximum value is. And the maximum value of the electric field is given by this expression right here. All right, and that's fine. That continues all the way up to the radius of the sphere. And then what do you have? You simply have the expression that looks like a point charge, right? When we're on the outside of this object, it behaves identical to a point charge placed right at the origin. And you have kind of the inverse square law that we uh, see for point charges. Okay, so this is kind of a nice sketch. So again, how did I find this maximum value? Well, all I did was, let me show you on the next page here. Um, uh, this was uh, the steps that I took. So I started with this expression. I simply differentiated with respect to the radius, and I set it equal to zero. All right, it's uh, pretty straightforward to evaluate uh, the derivative of this expression with respect to r. And once you solve this, you're going to obtain that it is going to be a maximum value when the radius is, sorry, when the little, <laughs> when the distance from the center is two thirds the radius of the sphere. And now you just simply go back and you substitute this expression into our um, original electric field expression. You gotta do a little bit of math and that's what I'm showing over here. And eventually you get down to this result, okay? So that was the maximum that I showed on the previous page, okay, this point over here. All right, folks, that's it for me. Anyway, hopefully you uh, enjoyed this video, uh, showed you the steps on how you consider a non-uniform charge distribution and calculate the field everywhere in space. We'll see you next time.